possessions of his people. This is the day that the Lord has made. I wait on him with great expectations. Thank you. You can be seated. We're going to keep saying that and reading that every day of the year until this year is up and or you believe it. So just to let you know. We're going back to the Sermon on the Mount today, so if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 6. Um, I'm curious to know, have any of you learned, has anybody learned anything about this particular passage of Scripture you didn't know? Is anybody awake? <laughs> I hope so. The idea is for the, to let the Scripture form you and conform you. And remember this, the preaching of the Word of God is for two purposes. It's to either comfort the disturbed or disturb the comfortable. All right? So let's go back to the model prayer. Um, if I can get this to advance. And we're in Matthew 6, starting with verse 19. Jesus said, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debtors, our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. All right, we got most of the way through this last week. We're going to finish the prayer today. We're not going to finish the Sermon on the Mount, uh, but we will finish the model prayer. And we're going to start with verse 11 where Jesus said, Give us this day our daily bread. What's this next slide? Okay, that's the rest of the prayer. We'll get to that in a minute. Now, for those of us who live in the Western world, especially those of us who live here and are blessed to be in the United States, the, the idea of praying for something that is in as much abundance as bread as we have here today almost seems like a needless prayer. I mean, the truth is, you look around the United States, we, we, we could really stand to slow down on our food consumption. I mean, the truth of the matter is, the United States is the most obese nation on, on, the, on the planet. Now, if you're talking about a Christian who lives in Ethiopia or in Venezuela, a request like this would make great sense. I mean, but for the most part, Give us this day our daily bread is almost an irrelevant prayer for most well-fed Americans. But this part of the prayer applies to a lot more than just what we eat. In fact, I want to break down from you some of the elements of how God provides for us according to what this scripture says. What does God provide? Well, let's start with the substance of the prayer. Bread is not just food. Bread symbolizes everything we need for every day. In fact, Martin Luther said this. He said, everything necessary for the, for the preservation of this life is bread, including food, a healthy body, good weather, a house, home, wife, children, good government, and peace. So, um, I just read that for you, and now I'll show it to you. Can, can y'all tell what kind of week I've had? <laughs> Here's what's amazing about God. God spoke the entire universe into being. Just with the Word. He spoke it, and it was. This same God who controls all of time and space, this all-sufficient, all-surpassing, encompassing God cares about providing for the things that you need from day to day. Now think about that. He's concerned about your food, your clothes, your lodging. In fact, he obligates himself to provide those things for his children. And when you look at this prayer, you realize it's both a request, but it's also an affirming declaration. And that's why it's just as applicable to the well-fed American as it is to the person in a third world country who has very little or nothing to eat. It declares, 
that every good thing we have comes from him. James 1 and 17 says this, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. That's the substance. Now, the source, according to the prayer, is our Father. I mean, that's how the prayer begins. It's lifted up to our Father. Now, tell me if this isn't so. More times than not, when all of our needs are met, and when we are basically well taken care of, we're inclined to think we can handle things from now on. We, we've got this. We've got, what we, we got our stuff. We can do this. I mean, and that's what we do. We earn our own money. We purchase our own homes. We buy the food and the clothing that we need. But the Bible says that even the hardest working, most successful among us owes everything that they have to the fact that God provides it. Going back to the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 8, it says, You shall remember that the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth. And that word wealth means Everything that has originated from the creating power of God. Everything that has been made available to mankind. Anything you gain or achieve is because of His good graces. In fact, did you know that God was providing for man before He was even created? I mean, look at this. The Scripture says, when God had created Adam... And then he created the helper, the woman. And by the way, let me help you, clar be sure you clarify something. Before the fall, they were both called Adam. All right, they were one. All right, so when I talk about the, Adam and the woman, I'm talking about them as one and the same. They are a unit. They, they were, they were a, a full puzzle piece, you know, put together. But before God had created them, Look at this. After he done, after he done so, after he had blessed them, he said this, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. Get this. Before they ever appeared, God already had everything they needed waiting for them. You think he takes care of us? And he's continued to provide for people ever since. Every single thing we have is because God has provided it. And not to thank him for that provision, to be ungrateful or to be indifferent, is a great and grievous sin. The third part of that affirmation it starts with the substance goes to the source then there's the supplication the supplication is expressed in the word give you see what this acknowledges first of all is our need even though God has provided for us in the past we still ask him to provide for us today we still trust him to provide for us tomorrow now let me make sure you understand something God does not obligate himself to meet the physical needs of everyone. But only those who trust him. Those who can call him Father. And we need to keep that in perspective. He provides for those who put their faith and their trust in him. So we start with the, so we start with the, the substance, moves to the source... Then there's a supplication, and then there's our part. We are the seeker. That's us. The us in the prayer are people who belong to him. Now, Paul was speaking to believers in the Corinthian church, and he reminded them of this. He said, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. God provides it. 
He gives it so that our harvest, he calls it a harvest of your righteousness, can increase. And the seed is not what, just what we put in the ground. It's the Word. It's the seed that is implanted in our heart, which we scatter for others to hear. Did you ever stop to think that the greatest cause of famine in the world is not from poor agricultural practice or from inadequate growing situations. It's because of spiritual darkness. Now, think about this with me for just an, a moment, as an example. India is one of the most impoverished nations on the face of the earth. But their Hindu belief system hinders any attempt that might be made to try to change that environment. You see, the typical Hindu believes that man is just the incarnation of a soul that is making its way through uh, existence to Moscow, which is called the place of final release. And on this journey, every soul will go through a multiple cycle of reincarnation. And you will either go up the ladder or go down the ladder according to the way you are living in this current existence. Therefore, they see poverty and sickness as penance for people's previous sins. And if you try to help somebody out of that poverty, you're interfering with their karma and thus you're doing damage to their spiritual journey. And it's not because there's not things available to them. You know, the Hindus, they don't eat animals. They especially worship or, or hold cows in extreme reverence because they believe that animals are very likely somebody's reincarnated relatives. Probably makes for some very interesting family reunions. <laughs> but now consider this for comparison. Every place where the gospel has taken root, you find a deep concern for human rights, you find the poor being taken care of, you find orphanages being established. You find hospitals being built. You see slavery being abolished. And the list goes on and on. Where you find the Christian faith, people are elevated. And you don't find these things happening in the social and philosophical structure of pagan world religions. I mean, even Islam. Somebody has a hard time, they're cast out, or they're, they're destitute. It's the will of Allah. Sorry, that's just a lot you drew. But in the faith that we call Christianity, when somebody is down and out or destitute, what do they find? Someone reaching down to help them come up. That's the difference. Look, look. If people do not have a proper view of God, they can never develop a proper view of man. But if you have the right view of God through a right relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ, you are promised the care and the provision of your Heavenly Father. I mean, look at what Jesus says in Matthew 6. We're going to come to this in a, in, in a couple of weeks. But look at what Jesus said. He said, Therefore I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food? And the body more than clothing. And then he says in a few verses dropping down. He says for the Gentiles seek all of these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. And all of these things will be added to you as well. Beloved right here is the key. Do you see it? The key is to seek his kingdom first. Do this, and he will provide what you need. Now, I didn't say he's going to make you rich. And what is rich in the eyes of the beholder? I mean, you, you take the average American standard of living, and you compare it with the rest of the world, all of us. 
are extremely wealthy. Now, are y'all asleep or are you with me? All right, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping I'm making you think. That, that's the key, all right? So you've got substance, source, supplication, seeking, and that brings us to the schedule. Give us this day, today, every day, day by day. This means we trust him one day at a time. We don't, we don't expect him to provide for us for the week, not for the month, not for the next year. We pray for his provision today, for today. Remember Israel in the wilderness and God began to provide manna. Do you remember the instructions? Gather enough for what you will need today. Don't, don't gather for tomorrow. Just gather what you need today. Some had to learn that lesson the hard way. You remember what they did? They gathered more than they needed, thinking, ha, huh, tomorrow morning we're going to sleep in. Let me keep, nope, there it is. Anyway, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna take it easy because they've gotten more. So, <laughs> physician, physician, heal thyself. Where was I? We're talking about the people with manna, right? So they, they gather more than they need for the next day, and they get up the next morning, they go to their, their little clay pot, and they open it up for breakfast, and there's nothing like a great big pancake made of maggots. Because that's what they found. They, it could not be stored overnight. Because God wanted them to understand, I will take care of you day by day. You with me? Any of y'all need batteries? All right, let's move on. Let's talk about what God pardons. And this is continuing in, in verse 12. He says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, I want to highlight the word debts here. This comes from a Greek term, ophelima, which is one of five words in the Greek that we translate as the word sin. Now, this particular word in the verb form is used 30 plus times in the New Testament. And it always refers to moral or spiritual debt. You know, sin is a moral, spiritual debt that we owe to God. And it is a debt... That has to be paid. And we're not talking about owing money. We're talking about owing our very spiritual existence. So, here's the problem. The problem is our sin. See, sin is that thing that separates us from God. This makes, this makes sin man's greatest problem, and, it makes him, and this is man's greatest enemy. See, sin has contaminated every person that has ever lived and, has, and what has sin done to us as a, race, as a human race, it's made us susceptible to disease, to illness, to every form of evil. It has brought unhappiness into our lives. It ultimately leads to death and to condemnation. And the common denominator in every crime, every theft, every murder... Every immoral act, every sickness, every pain, and every sorrow is sin. It's the moral and spiritual disease for which we have no cure. But those who trust in Jesus 
have received pardon for their sin, and they are saved from eternal hell. They are trusting in Jesus, and that pays the debt that we owe. Now, because man's greatest problem is sin, and his greatest need is, is forgiveness, that brings us to what God provides, and that is a Savior. We need to pray, forgive us. You see, forgiveness is really the core value of all six of these verses. You see, forgiveness is mentioned six times in this brief little prayer. And it says that everything either leads or takes us away from being forgiven. And listen to me carefully. Even Christians if they allow themselves to be tempted, can fall back into sin. I don't like that. I wish I could, I wish I could change it, but I'm not, I'm not Calvinistic enough. <laughs> but here's what James, or what John said. This is a reminder and a warning. He said, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, beloved, the wonderful thing about God is this. He's eager to forgive sinners. And fortunately, He is also a God of second chances. Paul said in Romans 5 and verse 20, he says, Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Now, that doesn't mean you sin to get more grace. It's just saying, listen, if you blow it, there's grace enough. Just don't blow it. Stay true. Stay righteous. So, we've got the problem. You've got the provision. We've got a plea. And that plea is forgiveness. Asking for forgiveness implies You've got something to confess. And if you don't offer your feet to Christ, He can't wash them. Do you hear me? That's a great, that's, I love that picture. I, I worked on that one all week. If you don't offer your feet to Christ, He can't wash them. Sin has to be confessed before it can be forgiven. Listen to me. Forgiveness is conditional. 1 John 1 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, there's the, there's a, it's conditional. If, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, to confess basically means I agree with God that my sin is defiling it's wicked, and it has no part in any relationship with Him. But it's hard for people to confess their sins because pride is a powerful force. And that's what keeps us from confessing. Nothing else. It's just our pride. Proverbs 28 and 13 says, Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy listen to me beloved a true and committed believer will never treat God's promise of forgiveness as a license to sin you listen you're treading on very thin ice when you begin to abuse and presume on his grace I mean on the contrary you ought to regard your forgiveness as a springboard towards spiritual growth and to sanctification. Yet, we ought to constantly be thanking God for a love that is so great. You know how great it is? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's an old Puritan saint, centuries past, prayed this prayer. Grant me never to lose sight of the exceeding sinfulness of sin, the exceeding righteousness of salvation, the exceeding glory of God, the exceeding beauty of His holiness, and the exceeding wonder 
of grace. A lot of exceeding in there. And that brings us to the pre-existing condition. Now there's, I, I put this in here because there's a little bit of a caveat in this prayer. You see, we have to address something of great, of great importance if we desire to be forgiven. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And beloved, here is a sobering but very simple principle. If we forgive, we will be forgiven. If we will forgive, we will be forgiven. Turn that page over. If we will not forgive, what do you think it says? We will not be forgiven. You see, we're called to forgive because forgiveness is a characteristic of the heart of righteousness. If we are citizens in the kingdom of God, we have been blessed and we have received mercy. But only if we have been merciful. Let me take you back to Matthew 5 and verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. It's conditional. The prerequisite is even you must love your enemies. Remember this. Even your enemies were created in the image of God. We forgive because it's the example that Christ gave us. Ephesians 4 and verse 32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as, Christ, as God in Christ forgave you. So here's what forgiving one another does. Forgiving others reflects the grace and the forgiving nature of God, and it demonstrates the highest virtue that a man can achieve. Proverbs 19.11 says, Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. And be sure you hear this. As you forgive others, you escape God's discipline. Listen, if you have an unforgiving spirit, that's sin. And where there is sin, there is discipline. I mean, the Apostle Paul spoke about this problem of unrepented sin in 1 Corinthians 11. I don't have that one up here, but listen to this. He said, that's why many of you are weak and ill, and some of you have died. Do you fully understand what this means? This says, a bitter, unforgiving spirit can damage your health. And when it comes to forgiveness, God deals with us as we deal with others. We must be as forgiving and gracious towards other people as he is towards us. Thomas Manton said this, he said, There is none so tender to others as they which have received mercy themselves, for they know how gently God hath dealt with them. Boy, this is good. This is so rich, and it is so convicting. So as we move on through the prayer, we need to look at what does God protect. Verse 13, he prays, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now I want to help you with a real point of confusion right here. That word temptation comes from a Greek word that means testing, proving. It, it, it doesn't have a good or evil connotation to it, okay? Here's what, it, here's what the prayer is, in, is indicating. Don't let me be enticed into sin. Keep me from the things that, that might, might test my resolve to stay holy. Beloved, listen, if you are a child of God, I can guarantee you this. God will never lead you anywhere or into anything that will make you sin. That goes completely against His nature. 
In fact, James confirms this in the first chapter of his letter when he said, let no one, um, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But you say, but that opens the door to one of those paradoxes. Go to the same chapter, but back up a couple of verses in James. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. We know that trials are a means for us to grow spiritually. Yet at the same time, we have no desire to be placed into any situation that might compel us to sin. I mean, if you want a hard example, you remember the night that Jesus was betrayed? The prayer that he prayed in the garden when he said, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Listen, he was dreading the prospect of having the weight of the sin of the world placed upon him. Yet he was willing to endure it. Because he knew it would fully accomplish God's will and it would make your salvation possible. You see, this part of the prayer is really a safeguard for us. Because let's be honest, you and I will never fully arrive spiritually in this life. We will never be completely free from the danger and the potential of sin until we find ourselves standing face to face with God. That is eternal security. In fact, quoting Martin Luther again, he said, We cannot help being exposed to the assaults, but we pray that we not fall, that we may not fall and perish under them. You see, if I pray sincerely and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, what I'm praying for and what I'm submitting to is the authority of God's word. That is our protection from sin. Psalm 119 and 11 says, I have stored your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So what we're asking God to do is this. God, keep me safe from the situations that might solicit a sinful response from me. Deliver me from those enticements. And listen, beloved, I promise you this. Those times of trial and testing will come. But when they do, trust God and His Word to bring you out of it. Amen. Amen. So how do we end this prayer? Well, Jesus kind of attaches a postscript. And it's a reminder of the things that He's been emphasizing earlier. He says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. It's as if he's, it's almost like Jesus is, is adding some personal commentary to what he's already said. Believers ought to forgive just as they have received forgiveness. And when your heart is filled with a forgiving spirit, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And by the way, I love this. The word forgive comes from the Greek and it means forgive. To hurl away. I mean, think of that picture. That God grasped the multitude of our sins. And he hurls them away into the black hole of nothing. Never to be resurrected again. It's a great word. <laughs> An unforgiving spirit is completely incompatible with somebody that's been forgiven by God. It frees us from God's wrath, a forgiving spirit, and leads us into God's mercy. But we know what happens if we don't have one. I want to read you a parable real quickly. You, I hope you recognize this. It's the parable of the unforgiving servant. I, I, didn't, want to, I didn't want to reference it. I want to read it, listen to you. It, if you will. Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often should I forgive someone? Someone who sins against me. Seven times? No, 
Not seven times, Jesus replied, but seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors who, who was brought in owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay. So the master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owed to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, Please be patient with me, and I will pay it. And his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me, and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you this tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. You see, if we have received forgiveness and then we refuse to forgive others, God's response is quick and it's severe. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. One of the most dangerous things we have to deal with is an unforgiving heart, a bitter spirit. Because these things forfeit God's blessings and it opens the door to judgment. To receive pardon from a holy God and then refuse to pardon others is a gross abuse of mercy. And James says in chapter 2, For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So let me try to compress this model prayer just down into a, a, a brief capsule. God is holy. And we desire to see His will done on the earth. He provides for us daily as we trust in His provision. He will never lead us astray. And He will forgive our sins, that is, if we will also be forgiving. Beloved, listen to me. Listen, 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 listen. Everything hinges on that last statement. Everything. If you want to know this holy God, if you want to experience His will being done in and through your life, if you want Him to provide and take care of your needs, if you want Him to guide your steps, if you need and desire His forgiveness, listen, it all hinges on your willingness to forgive those who have sinned against you. And if you are unwilling, everything else is voided and invalidated. We say we want to be like Christ. I want to be like Jesus. I want people to see Jesus in me. But if they can't see forgiveness, if they have sinned against you and if they cannot see forgiveness, they do not see Jesus. Bitterness is a cancer. And we can, and, and for those of you who have had family members who went through cancer treatment, you know 
You can try to get ahead of it. You can try to slow it down. You can try to divert it. You can try to change it. But it's still cancer. There's only one thing. There's only one cure. And that is eradication. It's got to be removed. If there is bitterness, if you carry a bitterness in your heart, beloved, against anyone. Don't let it cost you the kingdom. Don't let it cost you your eternal salvation. Forgive our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And if you will not forgive others their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will not forgive you your trespasses. Bitterness carries too high a price. If you've got a grudge against somebody, if you've got a bitterness against somebody, you need to lay it at the altar and at the foot of the cross and say, Lord Jesus, cleanse me of this. Get this out of me. Forgive me. And give me the grace to forgive them. And by the way, you say, well, I can't forgive them. Yes, you may be right, but he can through you. He can do what you cannot. So if you say, I cannot forgive them, you're saying God can't do. We're about to, to close and we're, we're going to sing. We've been singing just as I am. And we're going to continue to sing it all the way through this Sermon on the Mount series. Because I believe the purpose of this, this entire sermon was to pierce our hearts so that we might see ourselves as we really are. And that is the only way we can come to Christ. As we are. We can't clean ourselves up and make ourselves acceptable. We can't find a level of mercy and grace that says, Okay, I'm here. Will you take me? No. We come as we are. And that means with our sin, with our bitterness, with our hatred, with our failures. And we lay them at the foot of the cross. And we beg for the mercy of God to forgive us. So that we, in turn, can forgive those who have sinned against us. Stand with me. Lord, in just a moment, we're going to finish this. But you are not done. I pray that if there be one here today that carries a bitterness in their heart with someone, may they help, God, may you help them see the the high price they are, they are risking to carry some kind of, of, of anger or hatred towards another person. Regardless, Lord, of, what we have, of how we have been wronged, you have said, as, you, as we forgive our debtors. I pray, Lord, for everyone here who has been wounded and who has deep injury in their heart God I pray today they'll, be, they'll begin to take a step that will lead them to a place where they will find healing for the hurt that they carry and that the anger and the rage that they, fa they feel against that other person or persons God may the healing salve of Christ just cover them and begin to mend that wound so that they can come to that place where they can say, as I have been forgiven, I so forgive you. God, help us. We don't want to lose the kingdom. And I pray that you would help us be forgiving because you have forgiven us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Beloved, I don't have to say anything else. The altar is here. If God is saying, as I have forgiven you, forgive them. The place of forgiveness begins with your confession.
and with your and with your determination to forgive. The altar is here. We invite you to come as we sing. Based on my merits alone, I'd, I'd all people would be in big trouble. Let me remind you, we're not going to sing anymore, but I just want you to take this home with you. I want to take you back to the parable that Jesus told. The debt that the, the first servant had forgiven was unpayable. Millions and millions of dollars. It was impossible for him to cover that debt. That's the way it is with us and our sin. The debt that we owe because of our sin is unpayable on our part. It takes a gracious master who will have pity on us and alleviate the debt, just wipe it off the books. That doesn't set us free. It doesn't relieve us of any obligation. Because we saw it in the parable. As soon as that servant left the presence of his master with his debt forgiven, right away he went and demanded payment of someone who owed him. The idea is very simple. As God forgives us, we must forgive. And remember this. The debts that we will forgive will never measure up to the debt we've been forgiven of. You are still far in the black on that one. Thank you for your attention to the preaching of the Word. I pray, you'll take, I, I, I pray this stirs some thinking in your heart. I pray that you'll let God process this and if necessary, change you. May the Lord bless you is my prayer. We look forward to sharing the evening of fellowship with you tonight. Don, if you will close us in prayer.